Well, Gosh. you might be it's true, but it, it the, 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 the thing is, is... Hello, bitch. Welcome to the Mouthpiece, episode seven, year one. Today, we're going to talk about some World Series of Poker structures with recently anointed WPT champion, David Baker. And then we have an amazing can't miss interview from the man behind the scenes, the man who runs all the Poker Go televised events, Mr. Maury Escandani. So here we go, week seven on the mouthpiece. Welcome to the mouthpiece. And um, this week, uh, what I want to do is there's been a lot of talk in the poker world about uh, the 10K structures. And David Baker went out of his way to get them correct. And I wanted to make sure I had it all right. So what we're going to do is we are going to call recently anointed WPT champion David Baker on the phone, and he's going to talk about the 10K structures at the World Series of Poker this year. So let's give him a call. Hello. Welcome to the mouthpiece, Mr. World Poker Tour champion, David Baker. What's up, Michael? What's up, my man? So what's going on in, with the structures? Uh, I saw that you fixed them. I knew they they looked like a horror show when I uh, looked at them uh, three days ago for the first time, and I was thinking Alan Kessler had to have something to do with these structures, which he probably did. And uh, I'm glad. Uh, no, he had he had nothing to do with it. Wait, why did they change it to and try and make them longer? So basically, what happened was, if you took a look at the last two years structures in the 10Ks, right? Uh, we start we started with 50K in chips, right? We would play one hour levels on day one, which I and loved. then which were great. And then we would play two hour levels on day two. Right. And then uh, if you're fortunate enough to make it to day three, yeah, they would stupid. go back to one hour. That they would ridiculous. go back to one hour levels. Right. Yeah. So uh, essentially what happened is we would lose about half the field on day one, which mm-hmm. was fine. Right. Um, maybe in some disciplines we would lose even more. Right. Um, and some disciplines, um, because 08, a nine-handed 08 shot pot game right. takes uh, a lot longer to get to a winner than a six-handed one winner deuce to seven triple draw game. Right, and we would we so, would get to uh, the it would take us a, a late late in day day two to even make the money. I remember that we'd bring back like right. fifteen players or whatever. Go ahead. Right, exactly. A lot of times we would bring back like. 18, 24, 26 players on some of these events. Well, so what they did this year with every event is they added more chips. Right. So they gave every every event gets 20% more chips, and they didn't change the structure. So basically what uh, the structure was when I looked at it was the exact same structure we used last year with 20% more chips. Right. So when I started looking at it, and and uh, a couple of the final tables that I've made in day twos and day threes that I've made in the last couple of years, I've noticed that day two plays really, really slow. Yeah, it was great. And too, too, too many people come back mm-hmm. on day three, and then the chips haven't condensed enough, and you change it to one-hour levels, and you basically, after a couple hours, a when you get shoot. to the final table, you're basically playing a crapshoot where... Um, you know the every hand is just no, I mega felt, mega important. I, I felt which, the same I mean, way. Every, which is good. every tournament has to get to that point, right? Anyway, right. But okay, so I took a look at that and I'm like, okay, uh, on day two of last year we would come back with and we wouldn't get as deep as we needed to on day three uh, to go into day three. Now we're playing the exact same structure with 20 percent more chips. We're going to have. We're not even going to make the money on some of these tournaments. But on they're day ninety. Two. They were ninety and minutes instead of two hours on day no, two. No, no, no right? they weren't. They were. I'm. I'm telling you, oh. they were two hours on day two. They've always they've oh, been two hours I on day two for several years. No, I'm talking about this and, year. I know. I look. I thought. I saw one hour, then ninety, ninety. Yes. Okay. Yes, and that is because I, um, well, last year. I talked with several players and we all agreed that day two went too slow and day three went too fast. Yeah. 
So the only way to really even that out was to speed up day two a little bit and slow down day three. So instead of having uh, 90 minutes on day, instead of having 120 minutes on day two, not getting deep enough, not condensing the chips deep enough, too many people would survive to day three, and then the final table would end up being very poorly structured because we would have to jump. So now what I... Uh, proposed and I put a poll out before I proposed it Mm -hmm. and it got uh, over 80 like 85 percent of the people um, that took it thought that 60 90 90 was better than 60 120 60 and it's not even close it's going to be better I said it last year the same thing so are they go it's going to be 60 90 90 90 90 now or it's not going back to 60 is, is it so this is what so this is what I did I talked with the World Series, and they were nice enough to listen to um, to why we needed to change it. Mm-hmm. And now they're 60, 90, 90. There will be some tournaments that will go to a day four. Now people mm-hmm. are complaining about this, and rightfully so. I complained about it first. Yeah, me too. Um, I, I don't really want to play four days. Me neither. But you have, to, you have to look at it from the standpoint that when you add more chips, that there's just no way of getting it done in three days without just severely bastardizing the schedule. Because right. if you think about it, you've got you when you register on day two, you can't play you can't play from you can't play all those people down to six people. And they the biggest issue that they had was um, they're trying to build an audience on Poker Go. Mm-hmm. And the one complaint that they had was that the final tables never started at a consistent time because well, what would happen was we would come right. back on day three, mm-hmm. we would play late into day three, usually around dinner time or something, they would make the final table, and then they would start streaming, they would go to like two, three in the morning, mm-hmm. sometimes they wouldn't finish and they'd have right. to come back and the lose, next day. And you lose the audience and, too. And, and, have, and have day four, and you'd lose the audience and it It just wasn't good. So basically what they said this year is we're just going to do everything the same, but we're going to pause when you get to six people and come back every televised event um, at noon on day four. So basically it really didn't change that much. If it's not a poker go streamed event, they'll let you continue to play on. But most of the 10 Ks were, were playing till three in the morning or, um, or two or three people were coming back on day four. Anyway, it's really not going to affect you too much. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, um, by speeding up day two, day three won't be, I um, I think you're right. I don't, I don't think it'll go in a day fours by speeding up day twos. Some of the, some of them will. It all depends on the discipline, right? You know, like Deuce to Seven. You know, if yeah, that's it's not, not going a, to Day Four. If, no way. If it's not a if it's not a streamed event, it probably won't go into Day Four. Mm-hmm. But you have to look at the fact that just some of these events just they're they're just they've been going to Day Four for years. I mean, when yeah. I won my bracelet, I played no. on Day Four, and it was a twenty five hundred. Yeah, um, I know. FPT and I came back on Day Four and played heads up. So, I mean, it, it just happens anyway. I think it's a big uproar about very little, considering the fact that, I mean, to make a day four, you've got to be the final six. I mean, how many to- of the 10K, not even of the 1500s and things like that, of the 10K, I mean, how many are you going to make? I mean, we're, we're all hoping that we can make, like, what, two? I'm, I'm, that's you my know? goal, to make two. Make, if you make two of the six, you, break, you at least break e- even or make a, in the 10K. No, but, I mean, you have to look at all the other tournaments you're playing, too. You're right. looking at hopefully make two or, or maybe three if you're lucky. That's great. Yeah. So, I mean, it's really not going to affect you too. It's not going to affect anybody too, too much. And um, the real thing to remember is the people who are complaining about the day fours, which again, I was, I was one of too. them, yeah. and I am still one of them. I, I really don't want them to go to day fours. Well, they're confusing the schedule changes. I mean, the structure changes, equating that to that's what's making the day four. It's not. Uh, with my schedule, with my structure that I proposed and they approved and we're using now, uh, it actually speeds it up a little bit. None of these tournaments would have gotten done on day four if, I mean, on day three, if we didn't do that. And then also you got to look at it from the, from the standpoint that 
since not as many people are going to come back day three, you can, you know, you'll now have a little bit gap in your schedule to be able to register other things. Whereas if it stayed the same, you might be coming back on day three and not even cashing or be coming back on day three and not busting till, you know, lunchtime and, and still not even have a final table under your belt. I mean, you really need to, we need to be getting to these final tables. Uh, listen. Um, or, oh. it, it, you know, ba- basically what happened was, and, and in the 10K dealers choice last year, it was very, very obvious. When we came back for day three, we had too many people and we had three tables and we played. And then after about four hours, like we were playing so sky high that, you know, you lose one stud hand or one awesome. producing hand, you get scooped or whatever, you know, then, I mean, you're just out. You, I went from like chip leader to out in, in basically a hand and a half. I mean, yeah, um, it, it happened to yeah. me two years ago in the dealer's choice where I had one and a half bigs. I ran it up to the chip lead and this is at two in the morning. That was one race near one. This is at two in the morning. Yeah. The, the limit that we were playing so high that no everybody had, there was five of us left. Nobody had more than four big bets in front of them and it was a joke. So, so basically I, I the hope you. is we all want to place a little bit slower when we're going from about, you know, 12 people down to one. We would all like to play a little bit slower. The right. problem is none of us want to play extra days. No. So how do you accomplish both things? Not playing extra time and getting to play slower when it matters the most. Well, the only way to do it is to speed up some layers along the line. So mm-hmm. if day one already plays pretty fast right. and day two played super slow. So if we can slow, if we can speed up day two just a little bit, and we're going to get an extra couple of levels out mm-hmm. on day two, well now less people have to come back, and then those wow. less people can play longer. And because if I come back on a day three, if you come back on a day three, it's okay. I mean, I, I'd rather I'd rather when I'm playing for the bracelet and and the hundreds of thousands, I'd rather be able to lose more than one hand. Um, yeah. And I think most people will agree. The, the biggest issue is that, you know, also we needed to keep one day one slow enough to where you could still late reg on the beginning of day two. Well, see, I, that's proposal. the thing. That's the thing I'm against. I, I'm a, it's my biggest thing that I'm against in all of poker more than I am against reentries is nobody should ever be allowed to register on day two of any event. I think it's a disgrace. Uh, but when I didn't know that, like we, even the last two years, they had it where in the 10 case you had to register by, uh, the last, by level. the end of level eight. Right. Yes. And I, that think, was two, two years ago. Oh. Last year you could register on day two and here's why oh, yeah, they that's did right. It. Okay. You are right. Because I was really upset with the people in the triple draw that were, because Alan Kessler made them have two uh, at the end combined two hour levels instead of just the one. So it brought the levels were at three and six instead of five and 10,000. And the people were able to buy in day two with like 10 bigs and 10 bigs, as you know, in limit is a lot. That's two hands. And now they're playing two hour levels and the other people who grinded and only played one hour level the night before, I just thought that was kind of unfair in that tournament. Look, they're not trying to make the softest tournaments for, for, for us. What they're trying to do is make them the, these 10 Ks the most prestigious possible. Now, what can they do to make them more prestigious? Well, you can get some of the guys who play in Bobby's room and, um, who play the Aria one day high rollers, um, to play the 10 K world championship. Too. So, so what ends up happening is, if you make it where well, you have to register before the end of day one, your guys like Seaver and Rast and Cassidy and Showman and, you know, uh, and Gordo and Claude and all these guys who are, who are playing every day in Bobby's room or they're playing the, the 25 case at the Aria. Well, now they have to make a decision when it's 10 o'clock. Do they get out of my ga- their game and come play or do they not? So a lot of them would just skip the events. Mm-hmm. So, by enabling you to register on day two, they can play all night in Bobby's room, wake up at noon, come register for day two, and start with their 10 blinds or mm-hmm. 10 bets or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And uh, and if they run it, fine. And if they don't, 
they they'll go play cash that day. So I think it's a net pos I think it's a positive. It's not that big of a difference between registering eight and ten. Now, if you think it's an advantage to register on day two because you can't get knocked out, then you know, I, by all means, if take I had, of it. I mean, if, if I had they, the money you, like I used to have, I think it's a big advantage. But because well, here's, I, here's I, the thing, Mike, I don't, it's, I can't. If, you, if you're gonna if you're gonna put up the 10k, mm-hmm. you need to do what you think is in your best interest and the best advantage. Mm-hmm. So, um, and you know, guys like Venue and Chris Ferguson, they they reg almost every event. They every, think, everybody that's been winning all the tournaments were like the two of the three biggest. Uh, the the two PLO tournaments last year, the P- 10K PLO 8 and the 25K uh, PLO were won by people that registered on day two. And I just, you know, with um, 75% well, you, of the field if you, were out. If you, think it, if you think it's an advantage, then you should take advantage of it. Well, I just don't, um, I don't think it was fair like Sean Deeb. Not only was he allowed to register with 40 big blinds on day two of the 25K PLO, but they all since it was a one re-entry, they also gave him a re-entry. And I'm thinking to myself, they're going to give uh, a guy 80 big blinds to win two and a half million with 75 percent of the field out. How can that be fair? You know. Well, I don't know. I don't. I don't know the specifics. I don't want to comment on that right. specific tournament or that specific situation. And, um, your number. Your number seem a little off. I doubt that seventy five percent of the people were gone. At day there were. One, there but, was like a hundred and twenty. It was like four seventy, and there was a hundred and twenty five left. And then he got, he got to one hundred and thirty five left. I mean, I'm within ten. I'm, I mean, I'm not going to say I'm, I, I could go. Re- like re- other, regard, regardless, here's the thing: we're all we're all faced with. The structures we all know what they are we all know what the late reg situation is we all know how everything is going to go down so it's up to you to decide what you think gives you the best chance to win right. um i look you know i I, I, at, I, I, mean, I, I do everything yeah. i i sometimes i'm going to register on time sometimes i'm going to register at the end of level three sometimes i'm going to register at the end of level six and sometimes i'm going to le- register on day two um, to me, I want the maximum play, mm-hmm. and because I think that my skill edge is going, I would rather give myself the chance to win the chips. Obviously, I put myself in harm's way where I could be eliminated as well. But I think you, if you can get um, towards the top of the chip count list, that you have a better chance of of winning. And I'm willing to, you know, to put myself well, in harm's way that way. Right. But there are going to be times where I'm going to be in other tournaments and I'm going to appreciate the fact that I'm going to be able to register late and right. I'll just gamble and, uh, you know, and, and start with 10 bets and knowing that I have to win early. I, I just don't think it's really a huge advantage or disadvantage either way. And if somebody does, then by all means, but, you know, you do what you think is in your best interest. That's what we all need to do in these right. tournaments. Okay, but let's let, – let, between me and you, let's, let's just say – like 10 big bets in limit is two hands to the river. You have to be a really bad, you have to either run real bad or just play bad to lose two full hands to the river. And for other people to have to put in a 12 hour day and and you don't, um, there was like four tournaments won by people who registered on day two. Uh, we always had the saying, um, you know, tournament poker, stay alive long enough to give yourself a chance to get lucky. Well, now they're letting people register uh, with half the field out, and they don't have to play that whole day to stay alive long enough to get lucky. Look, there's That's definitely it. there's definitely case studies and things uh, that, that it is an advantage to register late. Mm-hmm. Like I said, Ben Yu and, mm-hmm. and Chris Ferguson both were, you know, either won or were in contention for player of the year. Um, the last couple of years. Look at Phil Hummus. Look what he's reg- done. He always late registers and, late, and and they register late a lot. Mm-hmm. Now you know it's it's the thing yeah. is if you think that's your advantage, go ahead. You also have to look at the fact that you know you're you're going to you know a lot of the people who are less skilled are going to be out by that time. Your table mm-hmm. draws are going to be tougher. Right. It's harder to to garner chips. Um, right. But yeah, you can you. You can run them up. You know, you look at the people who have won because they register on day two, but there's a lot of people who haven't won because they register on day two. I mean, it's easy. It's easy to cherry pick. You might there's be right. Be a, you might be right because be a, 
two years ago, Ivy uh, bought in at the very last level and he offered the whole tournament. So, you know, I, I guess you're right. You know, it's uh, you see the people uh, that's probably one of my biggest flaws. Uh, but you see the people that do well and you say, you know, that's they got a lot of money. That's unfair. I looked at the schedule. I'm, they start at three. I, I don't see myself ever showing up before eight. It doesn't make any sense because there's just there's not the dead money in the 10 k's like there used to be so you're playing with all, all great players pretty much anyways it's so well look there that's something that i i think needs to be addressed mm-hmm. um i think it needs to start with the 50k and it needs to um some of in the 25k plo and and all the bigger events mm-hmm. but i think it needs to trickle down to the 10k's too and we need to look at ways to incentivize the players to start on time because i've been saying the fact this of the matter is a yep. lot of there's a lot of the amateurs who they want to play from the right. beginning and there's a lot of the casual rec players and um and you then, know there's you f- the, the, the guy for the guy from foxwood who's who plays stud every day and wants to come down and play stud and he's you know they're we're jockeying tables and there there's a lot of movement and right. there's you know they have to sit there and look at 40 people on the clock and and, yeah, you know they, exactly. they, they, they don't they don't love that, and so yeah. I think at least you're on my side with that. that people. Yeah, but 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 here's the here's the issue, Mike. Before you get excited and and yeah. your panties in a ruffle, yeah. um, make make sure to get the facts. And I appreciate you calling right. and asking. But um, if these these changes that have been made right now, mm-hmm. these last minute changes to the 10K structures are better for everybody. Okay, not for the not for the people who, not for the people who are who are rich, not for the people who are poor, not for the wrecks, not for the pros, for everybody. Right. You know, uh, your time is going to be more valuable and it, the, the tournament is going to pace out much better. And that's all we want is just a balanced tournament. Thanks, brother. Take care, man. All right, man. All Good right. luck. Bye-bye. Talk to you. Bye. The Mouthpiece. If you'd like to take part in our phone call segment, you can give us a call at 702-329-04. Eight zero, And if you're a snowflake or a pussy and you don't want to talk to me, you can email me at mouthpiecepodcast at gmail.com. Also, follow me at the Mouth Mattiso on Twitter for times that our call-in segment will be live. Okay, one of my favorite part of the show is our phone calls. So let's hear what people have to say this week, and let's light up the lines. Welcome to the mouthpiece. This is Mike. What's up? This is Time Traveler. Oh, I'm fuck. To, I'm and you. To beat the world record for longest marathon. Oh, poker. you can't beat no world record for. I told you, I played like a week and a half fucking on crack cocaine in fucking 2000. Well, this, this, this will be with no drugs. Yeah, yeah, so just yeah. Just the Guinness World Record. Here. I played with guys. I played with uh, Yen Chen, who who literally played for nine days straight, never took a drug, never took a thing of coffee. By the sixth day, wow. he he was. That's amazing. Uh, but that's, that's a lot why. Of that's how there. he ended up losing uh, two million in one session because he was up for like <laughs> literally seven straight days. So, uh, anyways. But well, I wish I you luck money on that. Like that to lose. I'm, I'm planning on winning. I did an 80 hour session at Aria earlier this month and cashed out 1500. Had a lot of fun. Well, that's good. Just ha- just trying to have fun with this, you know. All right, well, man. Well, thanks for thanks for answering the call. You got it, man. Take Look, care. Looking forward to looking forward to meeting you someday, huh? I'll be at the World Series all summer. All right, I'll see you there. You got it. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Welcome to the mouthpiece. This is Mike. Hey, Mike. My name is Jesse. How are you doing tonight? Good, Jesse. How's it going? Doing good, man. I saw you're online, and uh, I have some things I wanted to ask you about. So I'm right. so glad that you uh, posted that tweet, man. All right, man. Let, what do you want, let's talk about it, man. What do you want to talk about? I'd love to hear your thoughts on uh, – I was listening to a Joey Ingram uh, podcast today mm-hmm. that went into detail with Doug Polk about uh, Johnny Vibes. Are you familiar with him? I read something about him, but I'm not familiar with him. I saw I read something about this recently. What is what, what does it pertain to? Tell me. He um he has a Hendon mob uh, that shows I think sixty eight thousand or so. Like nothing, not too bad. Mm-hmm. He makes YouTube vlogs that are uh, he's got like 
eight, eight or 9,000 subscribers or right. he gets like a lot of views. Right. He came out with a 40K package for this upcoming series right. asking for 1.4 markup. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That, so that was the whole, that's what started the whole markup debate. That's where I heard yeah. that name. Okay. And um, what's your question? And so, so Doug Polk came out and said like, man, your name is Johnny Vibes. You're all about like, you know, happiness and poker and trying to like pr- promote this image. Mm-hmm. Um, but then you, uh, you, you obviously compared to how many play, tournaments you play and this and mob score based on these, on these metrics, you are potentially not a winning player, yeah. but you, it appears well, you're selling your audience this 1.4 markup. Mm-hmm. Are you also telling them that this is a very high risk uh, situation? I just wanted to get, you know, yeah. this is something that's really well, that big was, right now. So. That's great. You asked it. That was touched on it on an amazing article that Brian Rass wrote two days ago. Do you follow Brian Rass by any chance? I'm familiar with him, but I haven't okay. read his article. Go, go, go to follow him on Twitter, Brian Rass. Read the article about knocking people who are getting markup and how it's bad for the game. Let's just say, and he made a, I'll just give you a summary of what he said and then you can go re- see the article. He basically said, yeah. let's say the guy's a losing player, right? Do you want to stop l- people who believe they're a winning player from playing in a tournament? So if he is a losing player, why would you be calling people out for being a losing player when you want that guy in a tournament? It gives you another dead spot in the tournament. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? And, sure, yeah, you don't and wanna, you don't why do you want to course. insult them and tell them they're not worth that much? You want to get as many people to to invest as much as you can. <laughs> uh, and if they, hey, we live in a capitalist society. You get whatever you can. It's great to bring extra money into poker. I mean, if you're somebody like Daniel, who's worth uh, forty million dollars, and you want to sell pieces of yourself at the World Series at even money, then you can go ahead and do it. You know, a lot of people don't have 40 million. As a matter of fact, probably nobody in poker does beside Daniel. Yeah. So, um, yeah. you know, <laughs> I uh, I think that uh, his, the way he wrote this article was absolutely perfect. If they, if you think they're not worth that much and they're, why would you tell anybody? You want that person and that's another person that's more plus EV to you. It was an incredible article. You gotta you gotta go check it out. I have I've always had a yeah. lot of respect for Rast. I always thought he's one of the best all around poker players in the world. And uh when I hear that uh saw that article I was really impressed. So Oh and, sure, yeah. No, and that other, makes total sense. Like yeah. of course you want to make sure that his package is sold hundred percent guarantees in all those tournaments that he's advertised. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah like, and even if he, if he can't if he can't play his way out of a paper bag, why do you want to discourage somebody from backing this guy? <laughs> and he made a great, great, great point. So, any other thing yeah. you want to ask? Yeah, man, absolutely. Um, have you? I, I apologize if you've already heard talk about this, but okay. what's, what were your thoughts on the whole cataphoric thing? What? Have you heard? Have you uh, talked about that recently? What? She oh, yes, that's a, what we were talking about yesterday. Okay, so we were uh, um, we actually were we're kind of looking or like. Well, and I guess she got kicked out of a WSOP circuit or something at Bally's, and she thought she was uh, getting in a four hundred dollar tournament, and it was a fifteen hundred dollar tournament, and I don't even know what the beef was. She got kicked out, but I was just we were looking this up yesterday, so I don't know what the whole thing's about. But uh, you could uh, you could tell me uh, what exactly what it yeah. was. Yeah, absolutely, man. So she, you're right? She um, she's made lifestyle vlogs forever. And she recently, with friends, she's friends with Marley, who does a poker vlog as well. Okay. And she's recently gotten into poker within the last year or so. Mm-hmm. So she's trying to turn, she's used to making content on YouTube and Twitter. Mm-hmm. Now she's trying to convert that into poker content, mm-hmm. and she's still fresh at it. She goes to, she hasn't played many live events. She, she states that. She goes to Bally's, because she's a Vegas local, and plays in the, decides to play in the evening circuit event. So mm-hmm. the late start, she says she's read the structure sheet, memorized it, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Uh, they accidentally register for her for the main event, mm-hmm. and she knows this. She says, "Like I got extra chips. It's not the same. It's not the right." Oh, uh, she only paid four hundred dollars, and they gave her the ticket for the main event. Is that what happened? Yeah. Okay. So she she says she didn't realize it, but but she talked about looking at the structure sheet. She says, "Like it felt weird. Like I had more chips. It's a higher blind level than what I expected because mm-hmm. I done my preparation to to be prepared for this four hundred dollar event." 
Um, and then she like asks her friends online, like, you know, she sends some messages. Hey, what should I do? And somebody, some friend of hers is like, just play it. If yeah. you cash, they'll probably just take it out of your, like whatever they're going to pay you for yeah. the rest of your, your ticket. So they disqualified like, oh, okay. her. They disqualified her. Is that right. Right. So she, she takes a few, she knocks like two guys out. She's got like triple starting stack. Mm-hmm. And then, um, the floor manager finally realizes what happened, knows it's her comes over. Like, this is like four or five levels after she's registered mm-hmm. and says, ma'am, do you know that you're in the main event? And she says immediately, yes, I do. <laughs> so the floor is like, what the hell? <laughs> Holy oh, crap. And, and, you, they, you and they disqualified her, right? Is that what happened? Right. So the, so the floor loses his, he loses his cool. Mm-hmm. The ballet's floor, he, she names him. That's a, that's a, a bad part about this video she made. Mm-hmm. That she like said his name was Nick or something like that. Like she calls him out, and she becomes the victim in the story. Oh. Like he was mean to me. Victim. He he Typical. humiliated me in front of my friends. Oh, she, and you know, on, on the other side, it's like, I'm, lady, it, yeah, you made, it, this is her fault. I mean, it's a typical. She tried to take an angle, and she knew. And uh, from what it sounds like, uh, I mean, I if I'm in the wrong, I th- you know, something like this happened. Uh, at uh, one of the Aria high rollers, the guy had signed up for the regular four hundred whatever the daily Aria tournament, and uh, they gave him a ticket to the high roller, and he was sitting in the high roller, and and he busted, he literally busted like three or four people, and they realized it, and they kicked him out, and they basically took all the, his chips and blinded him off, but it was kind of suck because it was. He, other people who have paid like twenty five thousand uh, were out of the tournament. They got, I, this happened like two years ago. I remember oh. it. And uh, so, uh, listen, when you try and steal, this is what you get. I mean, right. just be an honest person. Never steal from anybody, and uh, try and be as honest as you can. And uh, and then uh, that's the best way to live life, man. Are you going to attend the uh, the CSOP event? I know I've always seen you on like the little list of you know the Matt Stout's charity event in the summer. Are you oh, going to play that oh, play in Hollywood this summer? Oh, the yeah, if uh, it, the one in the uh, in, in in Florida. No, right? no, no. The one it's uh, right in the middle of the right in the middle of the summer at Planet Hollywood, the oh. charity series of poker event. Oh, I'm. I mean, if I'm not in a if I'm not in a uh, event, I'll play. Yeah, I always do. Sweet man. No, I cool, I, cool. I always support Matt Stout. Um, I mean, I've always been there for him, and he always fucks me and doesn't show up for me. But I still love him, anyways. <laughs> you know, uh, he does a lot of good things. Um, yeah, yeah. So, uh, but yeah, I, uh, if I'm not in a tournament, I always, I always show up for Matt. So, I'm helping out. I'm hosting karaoke for him this time for people who get knocked out at that charity event. So, oh, okay. hopefully, I'll see you there, and I'll get you to. Well, I'm hoping that I won't be there because that means I'll be deep in a tournament during the summer. So, uh, right, right, right. if you see me there, that's a bad sign. So, it's a bad uh, thing. Gotcha. Yeah. All right, my man. Thanks for calling. I appreciate it. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye. The mouthpiece. Welcome to the mouthpiece, my good friend, Mr. Mori Escandani. How are you? I'm doing fine, Mike. How are you? I'm doing great. Um, looking forward to the World Series of Poker. I want a lot of my listeners to understand who Maury Escandani is. Why don't you tell everyone? Well, uh, Maury Escandani used to be a young uh, poker player that played Mike Matisau quite a bit. Yes. About 30 years ago. <laughs> oh, come on. No, not that long. One thing yes. I'll, I'll say, Maury was absolutely probably one of the top five stud players in the world. Is that a fair statement? Well, there were only six six stud players in the world. So that's <laughs> not that big. He's, and he was a great at limit hold'em. I mean, limit hold thing was is we used to play – Limit hold them, stud, stud eight or better, Omaha eight or better, and Maury would like dominate and hold them and stud, and had no clue in the Omaha and stud eight or better, so it evened everything out. <laughs> has no, still has no clue. <laughs> well, um, I wasn't, I wasn't too good in splitting things, you know. Right. Well, uh, yeah, so. I don't blame you, you know. Uh, but those those are fun days at the Mirage. Uh, we played quite a bit. Oh yeah, and, uh, it was great. I, I remember you coming around and asking 
who wanted a piece of Scotty. Yeah. It, it would have been the easiest money I ever made in my life. And uh, it wasn't like these days where you had to put a markup on it or anything. It was just right. straight through. You know, he wanted to sell 80%, whatever it was. Right. And uh, sure enough, <laughs> I don't know what piece you had, but I know after that, uh, you didn't look back. Yeah, well... I, I tell people all the time, you know, I had a dream Scotty won in the World Series. I ended up putting him in satellites, used like 80% of my bankroll after like, I don't know, six satellites. And then I said, I, I can't put up much more. And he bet there was one more satellite to go in the, in the 98 for the 98 World Series. And I said, well, I'll put up, I was putting up a thousand each time. I put up 500, two other people put up 250, and I got a third, they got a 16th, and we gave Scotty a third. And um, yeah, I never looked back, but uh, I always like to tell the story as that was the only person that I ever won staking because I lost about 4.1 million <laughs> staking people after that. So uh, I don't know if it was a godsend or um, a death warrant for me, but whatever. You know, so listen, why don't you, before we get into what you do now and what you've done for poker now, why don't you tell some of the listeners some, because I know you play with a lot of old time poker players. Do you have any good old time poker player stories? I mean, there's a zillion stories. You know, when we play, as you know it, Mike, I don't have to tell you this. Right. We grew up playing poker where there was no internet poker. So right. every day there was a story. Right, every exactly. Every hour there was a story. You know, when people were sitting around the table, the whole idea about poker was socializing, having fun. And, of course, you know, bad beats rolled in and people reacted differently. Right. Uh, and, uh, and at times just your creativity uh, took over to make it fun, even when the games were pretty snug and not much action. Right. I remember there's so many stories, but you're telling me what is coming off my top of my head. Mm -hmm. Many people don't know who Danny Robinson is now. Danny right. was uh, an old buddy that. of mine that we played a lot of stuff together. He was Chip Reese's, late Chip Reese's uh, partner when they first came to town. Right. And uh, people say legendary stories about them before I came to Vegas, where Danny and Chip uh, used to play 5 and $10 and getting the games going. And uh, next thing you knew, uh, they just uh, dominated the whole city and they had all the money. Uh, and I got to set the scene for you so you can really appreciate what happened. Mm -hmm. uh, we're playing five-handed seven-card stud. And there was a hunchback gentleman, we call him Sid the Kid. Mm -hmm. He was playing with us and there was another gentleman named Tommy Cress. And Tommy, uh, and it's so terrible that I'm speaking about everyone that who's not with us anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Uh, and uh, uh, Tommy Cress uh, was big loser in the game. He was stuck, and he had a habit of taking his comb out and combing his hair when he was nervous. <laughs> Danny and I were playing Tommy Cress and Sid, and I don't know who the fifth uh, person is. I can't remember, but uh, uh, a lady came in. This was really late or really early in the morning, like maybe three, four o'clock in the morning, started vacuuming uh, the poker room from a corner far away from us, you know, like <laughs> one corner of the table. There might have been two or three tables going. I've been there. So she saw one corner and started vacuuming. And Danny and I immediately noticed that Tommy is extremely agitated with the noise of the, with the noise this, this vacuum was making, you know, just... You know, you're you're stuck big, you're tired, you're playing, and then just the noise of the vacuum cleaner it was getting to him. And we knew this because half, with the repetition of the comb coming out and combing his hair. <laughs> Danny, Danny looks at me and I look at him, and I swear to you, I knew immediately what he was going to do. It wasn't even like just one look. You know, we were pretty close in the way we thought <laughs> how we were in the game. Uh, just just like let's have fun that never went away Danny got up from the table and went over quietly gave the vacuum lady $25 the $25 chip to come over to come over by the, by, by he the. said 
over slowly and ask that gentleman there to move his chair so he can sweep <laughs> so he can vacuum up. <laughs> <laughs> and, did, and she did? This was unbelievable scene. I mean, this is stuff that, you know, you just don't see anymore around poker. So he comes and sits down and he gives me his head that it's all set and I'm waiting and the vacuum is coming closer and closer. She's unplugging it, you know, from one corner, bringing it to another, another <laughs> plug that's closer to us. She's vacuuming and Tommy is just looking at her, like getting ready to jump up, you know, like rip up the vacuum from her hand. She finally comes real close to her and says, sir, would you mind moving, <laughs> moving your chair? I'd like to vacuum under the chair. And Tommy got so frustrated that picked up the ashtray full of cigarette and threw it halfway across the poker room and, and telling her, just go clean that. Go clean that spot. I just made it dirty for you. And uh, the ashtray hits the, the wall pretty hard. And uh, Sid, the kid, really didn't know what was going on. Mm-hmm. All was a big loud bang and he just got up like all <laughs> it started like looking around like trying to figure out what was happening and then they saw Danny and I just breaking out in laughter they knew what happened <laughs> so uh, yeah there's so many stories like that they, they, they were fun I mean good clean fun you know you, you, know, you poke uh, at somebody and they, they were, you know Tommy was a pro he wasn't he wasn't like a tourist we would have never done that to a tourist but right of course obviously um, yeah, there are lots of memories. Yeah, and you know, I I, I got into poker as professional in '96, and I kind of missed some of the stories. But I watched the day that Sam Grizzle went broke in the, in the game, and David Gray got up and said, "Oops, game's over." And Sam Grizzle went and hit David Gray in the face. <laughs> oh yeah, that was a big fight. I'll well, never nobody- forget that. <laughs> It was so funny. I mean, there's there's just so many fun stories from the days, and you know, and uh, like Mike Sexton was on, and we talked about it as the fact that so many of the younger players do not appreciate the players that came before them that paved the way for them to be in the position to make the millions and millions that they make nowadays. So, you know, and I came after you guys and after Stewie Unger and. And then I was part of the big poker boom, and so were you. You could tell everybody you basically were in, um, you were part of the whole cam creation. Tell everybody how that came about. That's right. In uh, uh, early, well, mid 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 1990s, uh, I was. uh, Playing with me was, all the time and losing, but oh, beside that, <laughs> I was the executive host at the Mirage, so yes. I was a professional. I, I was basically a uh, poker room pro that they wanted to um, uh, consult with uh, about the rules, about you know, uh, making sure the tourists that were coming are having fun. Right. And uh, I had met a gentleman uh, prior to that when California had opened uh, doors to the stud poker. Mm-hmm. And uh, we became good friends. And he lived in New Jersey, but he came to the Mirage to play with us, mm-hmm. uh, play part of stuff with us. He just had so much fun playing with us. Right. And um, around 1993 or so, he started saying, you know, I uh, watched this episode um, of poker. I've been watching this poker, uh, World Series of Poker, on, on uh, uh, ESPN or other channels, uh, specifically like uh, I remember 1983 was the first time CBS came in uh, where Rod Pete and Tom McAvoy, right. uh, they were both friends of mine, and made it to the to the uh, um, final of the World Series of Poker, mm-hmm. and it was really unwatchable because they hardly played any hands, and right. uh, uh, this thing dragged on forever. It was boring show to watch, and my good friend Henry Ornstein kept referring to these shows that he watches that they're just it's not it's not they're not just a, they're not doing justice for poker. You don't you right. don't see what is happening. It's just the storytelling. It's not really the game. And he believed that if we could somehow show the players whole cards, we can actually bring poker to life. And he was right. Right. So we developed a table. The table is still in my storage. 
uh, we call it the Holy Grail. And the table was made for seven card stud because that was a prominent game mm -hmm. in those days. Right. And um, uh, we even tried to get a game going with where eight players played for four hundred thousand each. Like mm -hmm. made a huge game. But Henry's idea was have paramutual betting on the on the game. Right. So you can just imagine all the legal battles and all the uh, meetings and stuff that we had to go through trying to pull something like that off. God, that would be incredible in, in today's age. Can you imagine somebody, sh like um, like they do the live at the bike and they have paramutual betting on who's going to win? I mean, that would be incredible, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And he uh, was incredibly creative. I mean, yes. uh, he had 100 patents to his name. Yeah, tell, uh, tell, ever, tell some people a little bit about Henry Ornstein. I know, I mean, I, you know him a lot more than I do. I played with him many a times. He was, you know, just an enjoyable human to play with. He, I mean, he's such, still around. He's still a great guy. Um, God, he's getting up there in age. But it's, tell, tell everybody kind of like, like his vision on all kinds of different things that he, that he was actually involved with. Henry just uh, Henry had an eye for um, making things different and better. I mean, not that he succeeded all the time, but he always looked for something that he could improve and uh, uh, something that public would uh, appreciate uh, or enjoy or be entertained by. He went from car races to everything else, but his childhood. Uh, as a young man, he survived several concentration camps. Yes, I know. Uh, in the Nazi era. And uh, when he came to the United States, uh, he was, I believe, 21 years old or maybe even younger right. with absolutely no money. And in 1974 and 1975, two years back to back, the Transformers, the dolls, the That's toys right. he That's brought right. to the market sold $400 million and $500 million back-to-back uh, -back years. He so was the just, creator of the Transformers. I forgot. I knew it was something big. I forgot what right. it was. Yeah. Actually, what he did with Transformers, he, he, he was in a convention, and uh, this Japanese fellow that had some toys uh, that everybody was interested in, and nobody was interested in the Transformer. Wow. And it was a simple thing. So and Henry, you know, like, had saw the potential that this could be just a simple transition of one doll becoming another but then the sky's the limit he can like come up with so many different transformers right. and of course he was right uh poker the same thing like he saw what was lacking in poker and he had the money and the will to go after it and prove to everybody that uh you know once you bring the whole card cams uh, you can really tell the story and the strategy of the game mm -hmm. and that's attractive yeah so I'm glad I met him. I'm glad we made, we became friends. We're still friends. He's 96 years old. Believe it or not, wow. he still plays three times a year, three times a week. Seven yeah, card no. stud. Yeah. They play anywhere from one and two hundred to two and four hundred right. in his apartment <laughs> in New York. So I need, uh, to, I need to be know, invited to that game. By the way, um, somebody. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a few people that, that would uh, want to be invited, but they are not going. Yeah. to. <laughs> yeah, you know. I played with him. He's 96 now. So I played with him at the Taj Mahal in a lot, 99, 2000. So that was 19 years ago. So he was like almost 80 years old then. And, uh, you know, when he got in the game, it was, you know, he was a little bit older and it was, you know, it's tough. I'm sure he played a lot better in his younger age. So I, you know, I'm sure nowadays, he, you know, it's all for fun for him. But his, he's such a great guy. Uh, that's getting up there, like you said. Yeah. I mean, he probably yeah, he's hardened hearing now, and yeah. uh, his vision is not that good. But I'll tell you one thing: uh, the saying that Doyle has that we don't stop playing because we get old, we get old because we stop playing, is right. so true about Henry. Right. He still like he can carry a conversation and be very coherent about some things that right. would shock you and what he could remember from how many years ago is amazing yeah. and I really think that's one of the uh, biggest benefits of playing poker it keeps your mind sharp I agree and I will tell you you don't have to gamble for a lot of money I'm not I'm not at all promoting that right. but even if you have your weekly bi-weekly or uh, sporadic little games that you play with your friends Keep on doing it because the game really challenges your brain cells. 
that's good for you. That's why my brain is dead now because I don't play much anymore because of everything I've been through. I'm talking about the kind of poker that Henry plays. <laughs> well, you know, it's still the same. You know, I, I mean, every day that I, I'm, I'm sitting at home out of action, I just I throw the dog or the cat against the wall and try and gamble if they're going to be okay or not. That's my gambling. You know what I mean? No, I'm just joking. Uh, so, you know, so Henry was in on the on the uh, whole care cam, and uh, did did he go to Steve Lipscomb or I know he patented the whole car cam. How did it all come together? Well, Henry had a patent on the whole car cam, but mm -hmm. uh, whole car cam also are called POV cam. POV stands for point of view. Okay. And uh, now there's so many small cameras, even your iPhone. I mean, right. that's a POV. It's like, it's, it's sitting somewhere that can, you know, catch right. a tiny camera catch uh, uh, you know videos you can you can record things with so uh, at that time uh, there weren't that many small cameras so we had to purchase them for a good chunk of money right. and he really invested a lot of money and that first yeah, poker table that we better believe it or not I remember that table off, like it was yesterday that's 600,000 oh my god 100,000 of the engineers and uh, uh, you know, designers to put this table together, and then and the patent that was written was strictly for that table, uh, meaning patent specific, specifically said that the uh, the camera is sitting under the table, catching the images of the cards on a mirror uh, that is reflecting the image to another mirror and onto the camera and on. So. Uh, after, if, if that patent was written any broader, if it said something like uh, in any way or shape that you can catch players whole cards, mm -hmm. I don't know if it got it on. I don't know if the patent would have, uh, you know, uh, been approved. But if he could get that kind of patent on, he would be sitting right on top of poker right now. Nobody oh. could be showing anything without paying. Oh Henry. wow! I I didn't that, realize that. With any device now or or invented in the future, if you are uh, collecting the information from players' whole cards is, you know, covered by this patent or something like that. It would have been very difficult for people to challenge it. Wow. But his patent was challenged very quickly. But, but and uh, he wouldn't even uh, he wouldn't even uh, pursue it because uh, what the whole cards that came later again the point of view the placement of camera right. was inside the rail, yeah, which made a lot more sense. Uh, under underneath the rail, the cameras hit the lights up above, mm -hmm. so you really, you know, like go to that shot. It wasn't a very clean shot. You saw the cards for a yeah. second done. So when you talk about Steve Lipscomb, I always give him a lot of credit because Henry and I uh, knocked on every door. Mm -hmm. uh, believe it or not, even with the help of uh, late uh, Rene Angelil, Celine Dion's husband, who was yeah. a friend of mine. Ma amazing guy. Yeah, we went. Yeah, we went to uh, the top uh, dog and CBS Sports, CBS uh, uh, Les Moonves. We went to his office. We uh, Henry pitched the idea to him after Chris Moneymaker won the right. World Series, and like you know, he tried to get it on. Um, it wasn't easy to get it on until uh, you know Steve Lipscomb uh, coming in and uh, showing the whole world. You know, like what the whole cars can do. Him and Lyle Berman had a meeting with us, and they they uh, 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 licensed they they licensed the patent. They they paid us nominal amount of money, small amount of money, mm -hmm. uh, to for Henry to allow them to use the whole cards, and they were using it from under the table, starting out with. Then they saw the rail uh, cams that was done for World Series, and everybody adopted you know the change to the rail cam. Right. So um, uh, when Steve opened the door to tee to the television and put uh, the World Poker Tour on Discovery Channel, everyone realized that this small uh, uh, cable channel all of a sudden can have million six hundred thousand viewers. Right. And uh, after that, it became easy. Like it opened mm -hmm. doors for other uh, networks talking to us and being interested in it. That's uh, how the uh, poker superstars were born. Yeah. So you ended up starting your own 
um, television company that we basically filmed high stakes poker, uh, poker after dark, um, and you've gradually worked your way into no longer ESPN doing the filming at the World Series of Poker, where your company is the main company doing the filming. Why don't you touch a little bit on that, how you started that, and uh, how it's gotten to where it is today? Well, it, once I uh, learned, and I'm using that term loosely, mm -hmm. uh, the television business, which right. is, um, it's, not, it's not an easy business, but believe it or not, it's easier to uh, understand the fundamentals of uh, what makes good TV mm -hmm. than fundamentals of poker. Right. Uh, and I was, I happened to be uh, very lucky to be the person that was uh, a professional poker player for uh, a couple of decades or longer, uh, stumble into the TV world. Right. And uh, I'm glad that I didn't let it go. Me too. Uh, it was hard, although it was uh, many, many, uh, um, you know, at least a couple of years of 90-hour weeks uh, sitting with editors, listening to people, watching shows, understanding how the sausage is made. And, uh, uh, and I then putting uh, a show like High Stakes Poker uh, into motion, where, right. you know, if you had given it to uh, a producer that didn't understand cash games, uh, they might have not understand, you know, they might have tried to find a story in it where the game was the story right. and the uh, people that you brought in uh, were the characters that would uh, make it a compelling television. Exactly. So that time for me, it was easy. Um, I, I'm trying to kind of do the same things now because I've been away from many of the games. I'm trying to go out there and play and just see all the characters and see which one, uh, which you know, which group have a good chemistry together. Right. And uh, at the time, I mean, you, who was it? It was you. Uh, Tell me, with Phil Lock, uh, Ivy, uh, Daniel. Um, yeah. And uh, I was not at the mercy of the cards one bit. Right. I didn't care if big hands didn't show up one bet. When I formatted these shows, mm -hmm. uh, I would sit there, and they ha I had DVDs after DVDs, and I just watch them right. to uh, basically edit like a day to three hour shows. And I would have tough time, you know, like if I wasn't a poker player, I would have really have a tough time to make it look like seamless. Right. But uh, just sitting with you guys, playing with you guys before, right. and everything else, I knew that, uh, you know, like if I take hand one and then jump into hand seven and then hand 23, it, it will just flow nicely. Mm -hmm. So the shows were edited down to one hour or two hours. Right. Uh, it became fun to watch. And of course, uh, as we all know, Gabe, Gabe Kaplan uh, <laughs> really brought those shows to life. No, he did. Again, you know, and again. it was he was great to play with. He was great for the show. He he's he was still Mr. Cotter to everybody, <laughs> no matter whatever happened with Gabe. There was never Gabe Cattle, no matter what. It was always Mr. Cotter. And the good thing about this, like that's to, to the point that I made about me being a poker player and then trying to produce a show, Gabe was a poker player. Gabe wasn't just your average you no. know, guy that understood poker. He was a poker player that knew all of you guys. Right. Now, he had obviously the raw talents of a comedian right. and he brought it into the show and uh you know it was a combination of him and aj benza and all of you guys really that should get all the credit for uh, uh the fun shows that we had when i won nbc up in 2013 right and people were i mean the, it, you know all the internet trolls twitter trolls young kids like well, why is Mike Maddow still even being invited to play? He can't play anymore. He sucks, blah, blah, blah. And the bottom line is, is first of all, I didn't suck. Second of all, it was a poker show. People didn't seem to understand what you were always putting together was a poker show. We weren't there to watch... I mean, we had pretty much most of the best players in the world, but we weren't there to make sure that every one of the top head-up players in the world were in this thing because it was a poker show. So you had 
couple of celebrities that were invited, a couple of people who won seats that were invited, and the people that brought ratings to the TV. And and and, and every time I played it, it was there was I never had more fun playing poker, win or lose. And I think everybody that played in that show will will say the same thing that that was the most fun anybody can have playing poker. Would you agree? Well, with that, huh? you know, as a producer, when you, when you make these shows. Uh, as a producer, you want it to be successful, meaning that you want it to last long, you want them to have longevity, you want people to spend more time viewing the shows, you don't want people just tune in for five minutes and, and jump off, you want them to watch you know, as much as the show. If it's an hour show, you want them to watch at least half of it. Those are the success things that a producer looks, the ratings and all that good stuff. Right. But a poker player, what, is, what benefit does a poker player that's not in this show is getting from this game, that, that show that's out there. That was also in my head. Mm-hmm. As a poker player, I wanted to open the floodgates. I want people to see how much fun poker is. Come on and play. Right. It's always good to have fresh fresh blood, as we say. Absolutely. Uh, roll, roll. In the old days, tournaments uh, had that purpose. You know, like We always liked the tournaments because it promoted a whole bunch of new players mm-hmm. coming to our world. Now we had the TV. Do we really want to put two people there that you can just put their cardboards out there and have them wait for aces? Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that's something that's going to invite others to come in? Or do we want to have Mike Madison says, I'm getting tired of this guy. Let me show him what is happening here. Or, <laughs> or some you know, remarks like that, that yeah. you know, like people watch and say, look how much fun this game is. Right. Uh, I don't mean, you know, like... Uh, I don't want. To, I don't want. I don't like it in the games and the shows. People take it too far. I agree. You know, don't go far. That's going to be now uh, uh, disappealing instead of right. appealing. So, um, uh, you guys, I have to admit, you, Phil Helmuth, Gus Hansen, uh, uh, Tom Dwan, Daniel, Dan, of course, you know Doyle. All you guys, you know, like your characters attracted people and then there was I, and Ivy was the assassin Ivy was the quiet assassin you had all of us fucking with each other talking shit about each other having so much fun and then Ivy even though he had a lot of fun too I mean he is pretty a really funny guy you know he comes across as the the quiet assassin but he would throw so many remarks out there that would have the whole table just laughing their asses off so you know it it was really a lot of fun and i think that's i think what's changed a lot is the fact that you know so many great players now and then they give you all these chips and everybody's so deep stacked that you know it's tough to really sit and have fun playing for all this money in the no limits scene. Uh, do you find that to be a problem? Don't forget, many of the great players, and they are great players. Oh, they are. Absolutely. They are. Absolutely. They yep. really do play the game well. Many of them learned after playing hours and days and years on the internet. Right. What they learned was the game. Mm-hmm. What they didn't have to learn is how to socialize in the game. Right. That has become a challenge. I mean, uh, uh, they've been producing World Series of Poker now for uh, eight or nine years, and we are always excited when a character rolls in. Right. Because, uh, you know, these kids are so good that when they make it to the top, and, uh, you know, you see damn good poker, but there's that one little ingredient is missing. Do you remember, like, I think there was one year that they put some rule in about... Uh, talking to the player while you're in the hand trying to get information and Daniel went crazy like you know what why, why can't I turn a card over or why can't what's it one more head up you know what and why can't I you know talk to that person and then I I was the originator two years ago uh, of the slogan let make poker fun again and every time I play it's let's all have fun and the thing is is the people in the real world that are watching this, and even when it's high stakes poker or you know just a tournament, is a ten thousand dollar buy in in a tournament. Ten thousand dollars to eighty ninety percent of America is so much money, so much oh. money, and 
they don't need to sit and watch a million dollar cash game with everybody with or or three four million on the table which there were some high stakes players that were great to watch but as far as the everyday person that watched the world series of poker it it was about characters it really never was about how the bigger you play bigger big it it really made no difference because once you're everybody had ten thousand in front of them that was an obscene amount of money to the real world would you agree with that statement i well i do but but i also uh, i also think you have to be uh uh like a one-stop shopping center that that offers everything oh i agree so yeah. People go to the buffet. Maybe you know, you, you, some are vegan. Some are uh, like to have the, uh, you know, uh, prime rib or or soup or yeah, you know, have it all. So, I agree that fun elements of poker is important. But all of a sudden, when you bring in the best in the world and have them play a huge buying game, that is there's something there too. It may not it may not be appealing to your average Joe, mm-hmm. but there's a chunk of poker people that are really trying to learn right. and they're not interested in uh you know uh any kind of uh uh um, any kind of a chatter uh, they just want to see the best play right i would say that should be maybe 10 15 percent of it right i agree and i agree the other 60 percent should be an everyday fun poker that just attracts people and then kicks them up you know to the, to the next level right you have to offer them all and I think what we are doing right now at Poker Central, mm-hmm. uh, through the Poker Go, we really are, if you uh, watch the shows that we are doing, we have everything. We have mm-hmm. shows that are 5 and $10 limit to are you, shows that are 300000 you? Yeah, I, I think those shows are great. I think Live at the Bike is great. Um, I, I, I think it's great that, 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 that what we're doing because we're not, even when I, when I play on that show, the five ten game, uh, even though I have no money, it's still a small game for me because I'm so used to play it so big. But uh, I we ha- I have a lot of fun, and um, it's uh, you get some you know if you can get some of the characters that are willing to play small and just have fun, it's uh, it's a great it's just a great atmosphere. And then a lot of people play a lot looser because it's a smaller game. So if you get some of the top players in playing in like the five ten game, it's. Uh, most of it's a lot. Of, it's too small for them, and they they can't they can't win. Cause I I, I know because I used to be that person. <laughs> I mean, bottom line is, uh, you can play a very high limit buying game, mm-hmm. and table is quiet and it's all business. That's mm-hmm. fine. Right. You cannot play a smaller game and have people to be all business and be quiet. No, no, no. absolutely no not. No. <laughs> if you're playing the smaller games, it's there to uh, be the ma- major attraction to many of the people that are watching how yeah. much fun poker is. Yeah. Okay, so let's get into uh, what you have in store for the 2019 World Series of Poker and what the plans are with the television, uh, with Poker Go, and uh, uh, rumor has it, I guess you guys are going to be uh, televising every event, final table event. Is that correct? Well, I sound like a broken record. Every okay. time people ask me, uh, what do you have in store for okay. uh, this year's WSOP, right. I always say it's going to be better than last year. Right. You always do. Yep. The 2019 WSOP, uh, we have all the varieties in there. We have tournaments from $500 buy-in, uh, the, uh, you know, the uh, 50th uh, anniversary. I'm playing it. But- I said I'd never play a five hundred dollar buy in at the World Series because I played the Colossus like two years ago and it was a complete cluster fuck. But you know what I learned the most is now that you can register online and you put the money into an account and this is gonna make things so much better at the World Series. I can't even describe what it's gonna meeting, be. I was in a meeting today. We had uh, people don't realize how much work WSOP and uh, folks at the uh, Caesars Entertainment and Rio put together to make this happen. I mean, right. literally, the production starts from January 1st. I'm not making this up. Right. They have uh, weekly, bi-weekly uh, meetings, and bi-weekly meetings that goes into weekly meetings and go, wow. goes into lit- daily meetings for this to happen. Right. And um, uh, like today, 
uh, I can't share your number, but I can tell you already thousands have signed up to play the Big 50. Already. Wow. wow. It's so going to be amazing. Maybe the way, and they already have a few thousand in the books. <laughs> what, <laughs> They're getting ready. With, re- I mean, with re-entries, there's probably going to be 20,000, yeah. correct? You think? It, it could hit that. I was, I was, I was just telling that. You know, well, like five million guarantee is, is a piece of cake. It sounds like you know we have we are three weeks away and they have already a few thousand in there. Mm-hmm. But uh, again, this summer our camera, starting from uh, uh, from June second, I mean June first, excuse me, mm-hmm. it's just not going to shut down wow. until the end of until July sixteenth. Wow. We are filming. Every day, there's going to be two stages, and both of them are going to be at the Amazon. So you have the big stage and the secondary stage next to it, awesome. and uh, we are just nonstop. So uh, uh, the World Series of Poker is wait. growing. There's some really exciting news that I I would have to yield to the marketing team and the press release guys to put it out there, mm-hmm. not not the producer's job, mm-hmm. but. Um, uh, we are totally geared up and ready to deliver uh, as many more shows than has ever been produced in World Series. Oh, so man, that's going to be awesome. That is, that is, and I'm not again, you know, I'm hoping to say the same thing for 2020. That will be more than this year. Right. But I'm going to have time even thinking how can we top this year? <laughs> right. Looking at the schedule that's in front of me, it's you know, going to be a lot of. Shows. I was telling people, I said, um, uh, if it wasn't for me, that the fact that I always, un, without knowingly, dropped the f bomb, I said I'd probably be the main guy doing all the broadcasting on the networks right now. I I tell the story about uh, I think it was two thousand and ten in uh, when we we're doing WSOPE, and I said to you, "Let me get in the booth." And okay, you could get. And I got in the booth for, for like twenty minutes, and you pulled me out. And I I know deep down inside that twenty minutes, you're singing to yourself, "Please God, don't let Mike drop an f bomb. Please God, don't let Mike drop an f bomb." Usually, have four or five belief machines when you're in the booth. You know, usually there's only one. We just want to. Make- one escapes, the other one can come follow right away. It's not just fuck. It says fuck and fuck, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> but I always said the brand of English uh, that you and Shiki's uh, <laughs> John Shikan. <laughs> I love Sean, man. I love Sean. <laughs> all I have to, uh, all someone has to know is two words and would understand ninety percent of the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what. Listen, if I get knocked out of a tournament, there's a mixed game final table going on. I have nothing to do. I will come in the booth and give a little insight on all the players and what's going on because it is on Poker Go and uh, you can get away with a little bit, uh, I guess, on Poker Go than you could get away with on a regular ESPN or something. But uh, listen, this has been great. Mare catching up. a, it's great for the poker world to understand what's going on behind the scenes in the World Series of Poker. Um, I'm going to be at a minimum of three final tables this year, and I will win a bracelet. You can mark that down. It might even be more, but I'm well, giving, I'm saying I'm calling my shot like Babe Ruth right now. Minimum. Three final tables, and I will make win my fifth bracelet this year. I should have won it last year, but you know what? I'll just, yeah. uh, I hope you're wrong about this year's WSOP. I hope you're in more than one. Uh, you're holding more than one bracelet in your hand when it's done. Thank you, my friend. I I know, I, and you're one of my dear friends, and you've always been there for me. And uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna take a couple bracelets down. Get the, make sure those uh, broadcasts are uh, really high rated for you this year, buddy. All right. Take That'll on. be fantastic. All right, my man. Take care. Say hello to the wife for me, and I'll see you in a few weeks. Okay, buddy. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. The Mouthpiece. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening to Episode 7 of The Mouthpiece. I hope you enjoyed it because I did. Uh, stay tuned next week. 
where you're going to have absolutely an amazing interview with two-time WPT champion, Jonathan Little. Also, keep your eyes out because my first video vlog is coming out next week. Look for my videos. Tell all your friends. Tune in to The Mouthpiece. Thank you for listening. The Mouthpiece.